Well, good day, everybody who's watching. Um, it is April the 8th, and we are at the headquarters of Rail World in Greater Chicago. And I'm here with Ed Burkhart as a part of our National Railroad Hall of Fame uh, oral history program. And we're going to be grilling Ed gently on both sides uh, today about his life story and history in the business. And Ed, I'd like to start at the beginning um, in New York. Uh, you're a New Yorker um, and uh, maybe start with growing up in New York and your childhood and then moving into how you actually got into this business we all, uh, we all love and, and relate to. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess I fell in love with trains as a, as a teenager and uh, uh, that continues to to this day. So, my father was a, was a doctor, practicing in New York. We lived in Forest Hills and uh, on Long Island and Queens. And uh, uh, I could, you know, a, a nice uh, middle class existence. And uh, uh, one of the things, one of the uh, the the things that. Uh, my parents bequeathed me was a good education, and uh, so uh, uh, they they uh, weren't satisfied with the public school system. Once we got into the high school years, which probably has done nothing but get worse in the intervening years, but so I got sent away to boarding school, which was uh, I didn't like, but it. Uh, the, the uh, instruction was very good. The education was was sound. It allowed me to get into Yale. Uh, it was a lot easier to get into Yale back in those days than than, uh, than it is today. Uh, but I already was focused on rail, and there was a course at Yale in the graduate school of, in uh, rail management, taught by a professor Kent Healy who was very well known in that era. Now we're talking about the, the, uh, the uh, late 1950s. And uh, I was focused on, on that course and I became familiar with, with, uh, with Ken Healy. And uh, uh, I think this is one of the, uh, the things that uh, the admissions people liked is that I had a focus on something that I wanted to do. So you knew going in that railroading was in your future. That was that was my plan, and uh, and you know, uh, we talked about this last night. But uh, but a lot of teenagers have no idea what they want to do. A and a fair of number of adults, well, well beyond their <laughs> teens, have no idea what they want to do. And uh, and and uh, I never had that that problem because of my uh, my uh, interest in, in rail. What stimulated that, do you think? Well, that's hard to explain. It just, uh, you have to have a certain mindset that you like things, uh, moving wheels, and, and uh, this, uh, th that mindset could be translated into uh, any other part of transport. It, uh, it could be uh, in the trucking industry, it could be in aviation. You have a picture of a network in your head that's complex. Right. A lot of moving parts. Right. Yeah. I grew up along the railroad in Connecticut, the shoreline of the New Haven, and I remember being fascinated as a kid with the freight trains when there was actually freight moving by rail in Connecticut in some volume. Which, and, which town was that? It, Stonington, which is the far east, southeastern corner, but it's the main line of yeah. uh, from New Haven yeah, to Boston. Exactly, exactly. And, and the variety of farm implements on flat cars and refrigerator cars and all manner of, of freight, and it was always fascinating. Where did it come from? Where is it Absolutely. going? Absolutely. Well, that's just, you. You had much the same growing interest in the in rail as, as I did. So, so this is one course in rail at Yale. Just yeah, and it, and it was a graduate school course, but I took it as a senior. Okay. And. Uh, 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 the Professor Healy had a number of, uh, of railroad presidents as his graduates. Really? But his course, was, which was an endowed chair, this is an interesting story by itself, 
Yeah, typically, he had two or three students in that class. So you just sat around the table, and, and it was very personal. And, and uh, he was a terrific guy, knew everybody in the rail industry, was able to help you get a summer job. That's pretty important. He made a couple of telephone calls, and here was a summer job on the Rock Island or on the Great Northern or somewhere. So and did he do got that? got me into these summer jobs that, okay. I, that I had during the latter part of my high school and, and all during my, my college years. So how did you end up, where did you go and how did you get there for the summer jobs? Well, uh, uh, the, the first job was, uh, oh, I'm having to think now, we're, we're going way back. Uh, I worked on a track gang on the Great Northern Railway in Seattle. I wanted to, I was, uh, wanted to get, uh, wanted to see the country. Uh, they would give me, a, they would they'd give me a pass from uh, west of Chicago all the way out to Seattle. Uh, Kent Healy made a call. Uh, the president of the Great Northern was John Budd during that period. He was a Healy graduate. Oh, was he? Yeah. So, I mean, I won't say that they did me any huge favor or anything, but uh, they got me a summer job. I never met Mr. Budd, or, or, uh, but I did report in St. Paul. I had no idea where they were going to send me. They had to look at what where there were openings. So I reported to the what today we'd call the HR department in St. Paul, and they they uh, did a little thinking, and then they gave me a pass and said, "Get on the train for for uh, Seattle." It wasn't the Empire Builder, <laughs> and it probably wasn't a sleeper. The pass was not. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was a it was a, a coach seat, but it got me to Seattle wherein I, I was a track laborer for that summer. So you're, what, 18 years old when this oh, happens? Oh, I was, I was, uh, I just turned 17 well, that during that summer. I was actually, my birthday's in July, and this, we're talking about June, so uh, I was six, 17. <laughs> and you could get hired? Yeah, yeah. Because okay, when I did hired on, you had to be 18. Well, they, they, uh, they muttered a little bit about this, ah. but um, yeah, nobody was checking up at that exactly. point. Exactly. So that's a pretty big leap from. That's probably your first extended period away from home, and you're in a completely this new place, true. and this with no true. experience of living outside of the home yeah. environment. How did that go? Well, it, it worked fine. I I liked to, I, for example, in Seattle, I stayed at a YMCA. Later, they put me on a track on a section gang out in a, a town called Kashmir, Washington, and and they 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 did this on purpose because the uh, that foreman of that section gang was known all, all all over the Great Northern as not only being tough but being very very good on teaching people things. So I went east of the Cascades. I went out of the place where you were working in the rain all the time, out to the place where it never rained, and uh, and there I uh, I lived in a in a hotel. It was sort of more like a rooming house than a hotel, and uh, uh, you know, none of this was rocket science. Right. So were you a, a a track man? Did you run equipment? Did you? What did you? What was your? Well, they they uh, they had they, what they determined is that uh, I was better running equipment than I was at a pick and shovel. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so after a while of the pick and shovel, <laughs> they had me uh, running things like a uh, a hand tamper and things of that nature. So you did that for five summers. Was it always on the Great Northern? No, you, did, no. I, so you were a boomer. Yeah, I, and, and on purpose. I, I, these were very good experiences. They also, in terms of summer jobs for high school and college kids, they paid very well. Right. And, uh, and, and uh, so I wanted to get around the country, and I wound up working for the, uh, the Santa Fe as a chainman on a survey crew. That, by the way, got me a, a, a credit, a 
and uh, and uh, my and, uh, at, and, and my uh, in civil engineering at, at Yale, and uh, and uh, then I worked as a as a uh, machinist helper in the Rock Island shops at Silvis, Illinois, and. Uh, I, I, uh, there was one summer when uh, there was a recession and rail jobs were not that plentiful, but I found one in New York, which when I, that's the one summer when I lived at home and I worked as a clerk for the New York Central. Whereabouts? In, at 466 Lexington Avenue in New York, the New York uh, Central yeah. headquarters. Know it well. Spent many years in that building. <laughs> so, uh, and that's where... <laughs> where uh, I met uh, a guy named John Kennefick. He was he was the general superintendent of transportation. This is a funny story. I mean, I was largely working at nights in, in the what they called the freight service bureau, which uh, did a lot of car tracing and and God, we had we had the old uh, the early uh, uh, computerization. We had decks of cards and we were sorting cards and and, and uh, running all kinds of reports and all that 24 hours a day well one day I was working days the chief clerk comes running over and says mr. Kennefick wants to see you immediately and I'd never met mr. Kennefick and of course he was kind of God he was the right. he was about two levels up in the, and 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 uh, so you better get your ass up there, you know. <laughs> so I go up and yes, sir. And he said you heard that they, we had a Yale guy in the in the in the in the organization. Yes, sir. Well, you're making a big mistake. I later found out he was a Princeton guy and very much the Princeton guy. Well, of course, I fell for this. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, sir. You know, well, I guess we can live with it anyway. You know, then he he said, "You like railroads?" I said, "This is why I'm here." How'd you like a pass, good on locomotives and and freight trains? And oh, I'd love that. I'd I'd uh, I'd uh, I said I can uh, get out on, around the railroad on on my days off this way. <laughs> so. Years later, I'm on the Chicago and Northwestern and Kennefix president of the Union Pacific, and and we met somewhere at a uh, there was a bunch of management, and uh, I said I don't know if you remember me. He said I remember you very well. <laughs> so, You're uh, the only guy who wanted to pass for weekend travel on freight trains, yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, that's you can imagine. Uh, I've got. Uh, I, I got all, and there were a lot of passenger trains in those days, so sure. you could, uh, I got all over the, largely the eastern half of the New York Central. It's pretty hard to get out to the western half and get back uh, right. with it over two days later. But sure. uh, I, I knew all the mail trains, the ones that ran and that arrived back at uh, 0500, you know, that uh, you could get to work at 0700. So, right. Yeah. That kind of thing. So after that, when you get out of school, you ended up on the Wabash, right? That's right. So why not the New York Central or the Great Northern? How did you pick the Wabash? Well, the the uh, you know again, uh, uh, so many so many things are uh, by chance or making a connection. The uh, the then pr president of the Wabash was Herman Pevler. Right. That name probably is familiar. Yeah, to very. I mean, he had quite a history after that and before. And he was a Pennsylvania Railroad guy. Pennsylvania controlled the Wabash. They, they, the Wabash was very independent. We never saw any Pensy influence in the management, but they owned the shares, and they always sent one of their guys over to be president. Herman Pavler had been the regional vice president for the Pensy in Chicago, and then he becomes president of the of the Wabash. Well, before that, he was uh, he was the regional he was the vice president for the Pensy in New York, and he lived in in Forest Hills in the town that I was in. Well, my parents met him at some social event, 
Yeah, said, oh, our kid is, is uh, crazy about rail, and uh, oh, he says, uh, I'd like to meet him sometime. You know, so we met. You know, he encouraged me, and uh, I mean, years later, I wrote him a note. I said, I'm going to graduate from Yale, and, uh, and uh, would you uh, have some oppor opportunities in the organization? And again, he, he said, sure. So, Did you send letters to other railroads? I did. Wh who else were you? Oh, I can't even remember at this point, yeah. but there were three or four of them. There were a lot of railroads in that era. Right. Today, my God, yeah. <laughs> you know, what's, the, what's the choice? But uh, so I wind up, uh, I wound up with a, a, the a, a job called assistant to the general superintendent of transportation of the of the Wabash. I like the fact that the, they didn't have a training program. I wasn't terribly interested about going into something run by the HR guys, you know. All right. And, uh, and and uh, so they gave me stuff to do right away. We were talking about this a little last night. Uh, uh, the management guys were older. They all had families. They didn't want to travel. I was young, single. I didn't care where I was. I could be in the sleeping car four days in a row. And. Uh, and uh, so they, you know, I was the guy they sent the go for places. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I have lots of stories about uh, that. And uh, it gave me a lot of responsibility and, and uh, kind of gave me a free hand. And the Wabash was a, a nice, medium sized railroad. It ran all the way from Kansas City to Buffalo including the, the operation in Canada, which was interesting. They sent me up there. They controlled the Ann Arbor Railroad. So uh, I was the guy that hit the West Coast, the West Bank ports on Lake Michigan for the, with the car ferries, making the, uh, once a year we had to have a physical inventory of all the cars on the line. I was the guy that did that for, uh, for the um, December 31st, physical inventory at four West Bank ports in uh, Wisconsin and, and Michigan for the Wab for the Ann Arbor Railroad. So, I mean, the, the, the guy that would do all the dirty jobs, that actually was a godsend. I looked back at it and said, well, how, what kind of better, how could you have spent your time as a young kid any better than that? Right, right. So then along comes N and W and says we're going to buy the Wabash and the nickel plate and started with the Wabash in 1960. The N and W nickel plate Wabash merger takes place in 1964. Uh, things things change uh, not immediately, but uh, but they as they settled in they changed uh, uh, in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, the, uh, they didn't quite know what to do with me. Uh, the, the, uh, I was based in St. Louis. They had a regional vice president in St. Louis who was actually a very good guy, an NW guy named Clement. And I actually, uh, and, and they had, they sent a general manager for the Western region in uh, uh, named Tennis, who was a nickel plate guy. And I actually, uh, m particularly with Tennis, uh, kind of was his, uh, I had to break him in. I mean, I remember getting on the business car and going to Kansas City with him. He'd never been in Kansas City before. He <laughs> expected me to show him all the rails in yeah. Kansas City. Right. I th I did better with that than I thought I would. I mean, that's a funny, I mean, uh, well, all these stories, but we arrive in Kansas City at the, on the back of the uh, train that went to Los Angeles. It was joint train with the Wabash and the, uh, and, uh, and at that point, N&W and the UP. And it's nine o'clock at night. 
And I said, well, what time do you want to get started in the morning? The division guys had left us a car, and the keys were in the, with the station master. So he said, in the morning, we're going to start right now. You know, let's, let's get going. Well, we spent all night. We got back to the business car at 5 a.m. We had been in every, in every yard uh, of connecting railroads and, and, uh, and around the, uh, in the Kansas City all night. The Rock Island guys were out there at 3 o'clock in the morning at the hump at Armordale watching cars go over the hump, and the Rock Island guy said, we never see our own management out here at this, this hour a day, and you guys are, you know. They were all very nice. They were all very surprised. Sure, <laughs> so, sure. Well, uh, you can see I got along well with Tennis and, 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 and with Clement, who was the vice president. Well, but they still didn't know what to do with me. I was, I, I, I don't even, I didn't even know what payroll I was on. I got... I got paid, but then uh, Clement tells me, I want you to go to Roanoke for, uh, for a while. The uh, general superintendent of transportation needs some, some help, and, and uh, especially uh, with the knowledge that you have of the western region and all of that, you can, you can help. So I wound up spending about 10 months in Roanoke. Every, every Sunday night I would fly to Roanoke. Every Friday night I would fly from Roanoke back to, back to uh, St. Louis. No trains. And, uh, and, and there was no, uh, and, and I got along fine with the, the GST, who was a good guy. His name was Bill Ross. Uh, he liked me, I liked him. One, but there's no move to, to transfer me or to, uh, to uh, promote me or anything. Then I get to, I ran into, uh, there were contemporaries of mine, N and W kids, I'll call them kids, we were all in our mid-20s, and uh, they got promoted around me. So I complained to Ross about this. And he said, well, he understood, uh, uh, he said, your, your, your complaint is, 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 is valid, but I had to understand. I said, well, what do I have to understand, Mr. Ross? And he says, well, these are our boys, and, uh, and, and uh, we have to take care of them. And I, I said, oh, well, aren't I one of your boys, too? <laughs> well, of course you are, Ed, but you're in a little different category, and you have to understand this. Well... <laughs> I left that meeting, and Ross didn't, who was a good man, but he didn't have a sense of what he was telling me. And he was telling me, you got to leave. Yeah. He didn't want that. Yeah. They didn't want me to leave. I was, doing, I was doing all kinds of important stuff in that office. He was very upset when I left, but I, I looked for another job. Again, there were a lot of railroads around. I think I wrote to, to about ten railroads, and I had a I had a CV by then. Yeah, I'd done a lot for a twenty-five year old. Right. Or, or it's a little older. I was a little older than I was, probably twenty-seven or twenty-eight. But anyway, um, and I got responses back from three or four railroads, and uh, and wound up uh, at the CNW. Did you interview with the three or four that you that you heard back from? I, I, I uh, interviewed with a couple of them, and uh, wound up with a, a a similar offer from the Santa Fe and from the and from the uh, CNNW. So uh, even the same title, assistant to the general manager, and. Uh, uh, if you were a very conservative guy, you'd go with the Santa Fe. Very solvent, solid. Everyone moved in lockstep. Some guy retires. Everyone moves up one. You know that was the life on the Santa Fe. See it on W. If you were a crapshooter, Ben Heineman was was there, Larry Provo was there, they were transforming this company. This looked kind of interesting to me. So 
I wound up uh, at the CNNW, where uh, where I had a twenty. I was there twenty years, almost twenty years to the day. So when you're assistant to the GM, same kind of responsibilities, troubleshooter, um, gopher, whatever you want yeah. to call it. Out and of he had me doing all this stuff. I mean, one day he calls me in. You know, we're going to merge with the CGW. Yeah, I, I, know, I, I know that's going to happen. Well, I just heard from the, the lawyers that uh, they expect this is going to happen in about 60 days. What are we going to do then? I don't know. <laughs> well, that's why do you think I called you in here? Figure it out. Get, get your ass out to All Wine, which was CGW headquarters, and, and figure this thing out and come in with a plan. I mean, you can imagine. This, what a great opportunity, a, huh? A, I was 27 years old at the time. No, no. So when you show up in All Wine, what kind of reception did you get, and how much help or obstruction was present? No, they they were they were fine. They were good people. I mean, this is this is me. I don't go out there with a chip on my shoulder or something like that. I'm I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm making some comments. I'm interested in the people that I'm meeting, and and uh, if they were halfway smart, which Generally, they were. They recognized that, uh, you know, we're, they're not going to fight with me. If I was open to them, they'd be open to me. So I, I, uh, I remember some of those guys uh, that I met at the time and, and how they were working. And I wound up uh, filling a business car full of, uh, full of all the joint facility files and all kinds of operating department files and stuff like that and bringing it back to Chicago and then I had the operating plan. So as I recall, the CGW, a lot of it just kind of disappeared because it was redundant or whatever and how did that go over? Well, over the, I mean that was over a lot of years. For example, initially the Kansas City line of the CGW was very important to the merged system. The, uh, the CGW was, ran one train a day to Kansas City. Uh, the CNNW, by the time uh, we built up a lot of Iowa and Minnesota grain traffic going to the Gulf, we were running five or six trains a day in each direction on, in and out of Kansas City. Now, y years later, when the CNNW acquired the Spine Line from the Rock Island, that was about a railroad south of Des Moines than the CGW was. Physical condition or, or oh, mileage? Oh, physical or? condition and, and, and grades and everything else. Yeah, okay. So eventually that CGW line down to, uh, to Leavenworth, Kansas and, and across the Missouri River at uh, Leavenworth, which was on a, <laughs> a very interesting swing bridge. and. And, uh, and and into Kansas City on trackage rights on the Missouri Pacific. So eventually that line got abandoned, but not for some years. But but uh, right away, for example, the uh, CGW line to Chicago uh, was reduced to a uh, way freight only. I mean, we, we could include that traffic right on CNNW's main line from Marshalltown the two railroads crossed in Marshalltown, Iowa. So our Kansas City train from Proviso to Kansas City had used the CNNW as far as Marshalltown, then on the CGW all the way to Kansas City. So that was the essence of the, the plan. Later on, uh, I had something similar when uh, uh, I was called out and they, they said, the, uh, we're going to build a new ore dock at Escanaba and we're going to get away from the old pocket dock where they shove the ore cars out on the dock. Now the cars are going to be dumped in a rotary dumper and they'll have stockpiles on, on the land and they'll have a lot of, uh, of endless belts hauling the ore out to the, to the dock and so on.
So we need an operating plan to coincide with what the engineering people are doing. On so, yeah, and I wound up spending a few couple of weeks at Escanaba and working with the division people and uh, coming in with a plan about how the uh, how the uh, the operation would would uh, re relate to this new facility. Did you have to lay out new track? Um, because obviously the switching is going to be a little different for something like that. Sure. Well, for example, in the old dock, you stored the ore in the cars right. until the ship was, mar was was named. There was no place to store ore other than in the cars. So we had thousands of cars in that service, and we had a yard that was plumb full of, and they, they were different grades of ore and things right. of that sure. nature. So a certain ship would be named and they would uh, want so many cars of this and so many cars of that. Well now, everything was different. When the train arrived, it was immediately dumped. It would go in, you, we had differentiated piles in the stock in the, in the stockpile. Was area. it a single dumper or multiple cars? Uh, you, they, you could dump three cars at a, at a crack. These were very short. Right, 24 four cars. cars yeah. So, so uh, but was it one dumper that dumped three cars? Yeah. And but just one dumper. Exactly. It was like Lambert's point on the N and W, which was coal, many grades, five hundred classes. Oh, I, I remember that at Lambert right. Point. Yeah. Yeah, and there were four dumpers there, so they could blend and so forth. But yeah. you did the blending out of the piles. We did the blending out of the piles. Okay. You you could uh, put so much ore of one type in the pile, and then you'd pile a different ore on top of it. So they cut across the pile when they were with a reclaimer. So it was kind of blending as you did it. But it, instead of having three or 4,000 cars in, in, the, in the service, uh, the, the new dock, uh, we, we, we needed to have uh, five, 600 cars in the service. And, Big savings, uh, and and it 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 was quite a change operationally in terms of the train service and all that. So I was working with a division manager and so on, and and putting, and of course, right away the uh, headquarters is saying we want the savings out of this place and we want it now, you know. Right. And, uh, so. So I mean that was that type of thing that I was doing. Uh, Later on, and it was not uh, not uh, uh, too long after some of these things going on, that uh, CNNW had a lot of operating problems. They had a lot of business, and their operating management, frankly, was quite weak. I could see this, but I was not involved in it. I was making these special studies and doing that kind of stuff. So one day I got called up to the president's office. Larry Provost, the president. He says, uh, "You've got a very good record around here." Well, thank you. You know, where's this going? <laughs> you know, uh, I want you to do something different. Okay. You can you 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 uh, recognize that we have a lot of operating problems and a lot of customer complaints about service. And uh, we've got to get this fixed. I said, well, fine. And he says, I've got a, a, a plan how to do this and you're an important part of it. So, okay. He said, we're gonna have a department that's reporting right to me and I want you to head this up. And uh, you're gonna have all the customer service people, the, uh, the uh, all the people from several different departments that were involved in tracing cars and in, and in, uh, in, in uh, troubleshooting. And, and, and um, when you see problems, uh, I want you to present them to me and I'll see that they get fixed. What do you think of this? <laughs> I had not thought about that. It won't work. Why won't it work? Because it doesn't get to the core of why the operation is bad. 
Well, what do you mean? I'll, uh, I'll be the guy that'll implement the changes. I said, you can't, there's no one person that can do this. This is, uh, the, the problem is they don't have the railroad, they don't have a good operating plan. They don't have a system. They don't have, uh, the, 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 the divisions are uh, making stuff up uh, every day. I mean, we had a guy that was system general manager. He's a wonderful man, and I loved him, but he was totally disorganized. And he'd be calling out to some yards and telling them how to change the, mm -hmm. the operation because sort some other yard fly. was plugged. Right. Enough. Had, Provo, so he says, had Provo come up through the, NNW, or the CNW ranks? No, he was a finance guy. He was an Arthur Anderson man, and he'd been... Uh, he, he joined with Heinemann when they had a proxy fight and took over the Evans St. L. Okay. He was, he was a young guy at that time, was still quite young. And he, when Heinemann took over the uh, CNNW, he brought Larry with him as vice president of finance. Okay. Now at this point, Heinemann was preparing to go move on to, and they were establishing Northwest Industries and so on. Provo was, was the president of the railroad, but he didn't have an operating background. Right. So, so after this conversation, he says, well, are you going to do this or not? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> I, I surprised myself with my own <laughs> right. response. So, get out. He was mad? So or? I went back down to my office. Harold Gassler was the VPO. I went in and told Harold what had happened. And I said, I don't know if whether I have a job anymore. And he said, well, uh, maybe you just need to uh, stay out of sight for a while. <laughs> well, you know, well, what else was he going to say? Two weeks later, <clears throat> uh, Gassler comes into my office and says, uh, uh, Get your coat. We're going to. We we have a meeting at Proviso, and uh, and uh, uh, you're you're essential to this. So what's this all about? We drive out to Proviso. He says, "I'm not telling you. We're going to meet Bob Russell. Russell was a senior vice president of HR, and and a confidant of Provo's, a lawyer." by background. You'll find out all about it. When, so we pull into a parking lot at some McDonald's or something, and there's Russell waiting for us. He gets in the back of the car, and Harold says, well, Bob, tell Ed here what's going on. Okay, quite a story. Have you heard anything about, a, about a, a corruption at Proviso? I said, not a word. He says, well, thankfully you're not involved in it or, uh, or we wouldn't, wouldn't be having this conversation. But the, the three or four of the senior managers at Proviso have been uh, falsifying bills and, uh, and, and uh, getting kickbacks and, and we've blown this whole thing and there's a whole lot of firing going on. They fire the division manager, they fire the number two guy at Proviso, and they fire the two assistant general managers in the company. And, uh, and they told me that I was now going to be the general superintendent of transportation. For the whole railroad, not the just Proviso. Railroad. So I was 28 years old. Was I ready for this? No. <laughs> But you sink or swim. You uh, uh, over uh, 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 this was a project that took at least six months. Was probably six or eight months. I wrote a business plan for the whole railroad. I had a separate uh, plan for every yard. We we had I think it was about seventy five yards where we switched cars. Wow! I had to have a plan for every one of these. I did this all myself. They, they detailed a, a, a very good guy from the, from the IT department. 
because we were entering this plan into a computer program. Which, uh, so we wound up with a blocking and schedule guide, and we had we established train schedules and blocking. It was an operating plan for the entire railroad. Did you, did he or you together write the software for this simulation, or was did you buy some, or how did that? Well, no, they they were. Th this was not very sophisticated in, in this era, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know. I wouldn't have known anything about software. I still don't. So, uh, but this guy uh, was able to to download me. You might say, I would come up with a map of the whole railroad and say that this is the map that applies to the to the uh, Cedar Rapids yard, and we would show uh, for every station on the railroad what block a car should go into. He was able to then collate all of this and develop a, 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 a guide for, for Cedar Rapids. Yeah. We did that for 75 yards. I mean, I hardly slept for, for, <laughs> for this whole period. I was working seven days a week and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, when I stepped into that job, Proviso was plugged. We were holding out trains on connecting lines because we couldn't accept them. We had, uh, we had, uh, six, I think it was 62 or 63,000 cars online. By the time this project was finished, let's say a year later, we had 40,000 cars online and we were doing more business. So the, you're the general superintendent your head's down doing this operating plan and the railroad's falling apart around you. Are people coming to you and saying, hey, nice that you're planning, but come over and fix this stuff? Or did you have people that were, you could rely on to help day oh, to day? I had, a, I had a small staff. And, and, uh, and in the meantime, we had the system general manager, Bill Alsop, that was there, who he and I always got along. And I remember he called me in once, he said, I hear that you say we don't have an operating plan. I said, well, I've never seen one. Well, you're wrong. Let me, I'll show you this operating plan. I said, I'd like to see it. So he pulls out the bottom drawer of his desk, you know, where everybody <laughs> keep, keeps the files that they don't use. He roots around in this for about five minutes. He pulls out some yellow sheets. There's the operating plan. It was from 15 years before, and it, was, it had a, a half dozen trains in it, you know. And I said, "Well, that's a, you know, what am I going to say to this? We update it." I said, <laughs> "I said we need to update this." Okay, well, you and I see it together, you know. Go at it. <laughs> well, I mean, Alsop had other problems, being uh, that he was a drinker. And of course, uh, the whole rail industry, and probably industry everywhere in that era, had problems like that. Right. I mean, I remember the marketing guys said, uh, "Don't talk to any of them after after lunch," you know. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, we're we're jumping forward now, but uh, at some point, I was made first. AVP of transportation, and then VP of transportation, and then the line divisions. We had ten operating divisions reported directly to me. But before, as so what GST, span of time, Ed? what span of time was from GST to AVP to VP? What are we talking? Oh, about? four or five years. Okay. So the operating plan went into effect. What a year after you started working on it? Nine months? Yeah. And things and it, it got better and better, and I had to deal with these division managers who were all very headstrong guys, and they didn't report to me. They oh. reported to Alsop, but Alsop backed me when I needed it. And those guys, the division managers, recognized that I wasn't their enemy. Yeah, I was out here trying to fix things. Yeah, and that meant that I had to step on them sometimes. You'd go to uh, the division manager at Boone, Iowa. And he did a superb job of blocking for every place on the Iowa division. The Boone Yard, you know, it made detailed blocks for Cedar Rapids. They, they'd separated cars by industry at Cedar Rapids at Boone. So when the 
train arrived in Cedar Rapids, they didn't have much switching to do. But Chicago, everything was lumped in and, and dumped onto, onto Proviso. Feathers and guts, as we used to call so it. So what I had to do is take away a whole lot of that nice detailed blocking for Cedar Rapids, and, I, and then we started to make blocks by connecting line in Chicago. One of the big changes is that we, we I remember this day because it, it changed history in Proviso. We, uh, we never, uh, there were two passenger mains that ran around Proviso. It never had a freight train on it. One day uh, we had a freight train that went to 40th Street Yard in downtown Chicago. It had Grand Trunk Westerns, it had C&Os, it had the connecting lines that we that we connected with out of 40th Street. Before, all that stuff would come in to Proviso and be humped, and then they'd send it to 40th yeah. Street where it was delivered. So now we had a solid train coming out of Iowa that ran straight around Proviso yeah. to 40th Street. The guys, and the guys at Proviso saw this train running by their yard and they said, this is the end. <laughs> They're not going to need us. I said, no, for the first time ever, you guys are going to be able to keep current. Fluid. Yeah. You're going to do what you're supposed to do. It was that kind of thing that was going on. So then, four or five years later, uh, well, we had a few things that happened. In the meantime, uh, uh, Larry Provo died at a young age, cancer. I think he was, he was in his 40s. Oh boy, consummate smoker. You'd sit next to him. I, I mean, I, the the amount of stale smoke that I inhaled. I'm I'm surprised that I'm still alive. But I never was sm a smoker. I mean, he'd light one cigarette with the the previous one and died of lung cancer at 47 or 48 years old. And he was outstanding. He was a not a railroad guy, as I pointed out. He's a finance guy, but his instincts were good. And Took no prisoners. I have a lot of Provo stories that I can tell. <laughs> he also did, didn't mind tangling with the customers. <laughs> but anyway, so he dies. Jim Wolf succeeds him. Wolf and I never really connected. Where, what had he been doing before he... he... He had come out of labor relations. He'd been the vice president of labor relations. He's a lawyer. And um, was a confidant of Provost, so Provost selected him. Provost knew that he was uh, knew that he was dying. He, you know, from the time he was diagnosed until he died was very quick, probably sixty days. Oh wow! And uh, I mean, he and uh, Provost and I were supposed to go to Iowa to attend a meeting set up by the city of Cedar Rapids, where they wanted to move railroads out of the downtown, you know, and he called me in his office uh, uh, the day before and said, you're going to have to go by, by yourself because uh, I've got to uh, get some, uh, i got to report for the doctors. So I said, oh, I hope nothing serious. And he said, well, I've had this cough that I can't get rid of and they want, want to put me through the test. So I said, well, that's what you, you need to do. So I went out and I never saw him again. Sixty uh -huh. days later he was dead. Oh boy. But uh, so I had to uh, go to Cedar Rapids by myself. But uh, but anyway, so uh, now we got Jim Wolf as president. And why did they pick him versus you or somebody else? Oh well I, you know, I don't know. They. You found senior management was more comfortable with lawyers and finance guys, and we see this in industry. Yeah, right. This is nothing new. So uh, I was the guy that could always get things done, but I was never the guy they were that comfortable with. And uh, so Wolf becomes president, but but uh, he and. and uh, He'd been vice president of operations. Provo had made him vice president of operations so he could groom him on that job. So you were working for him for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was. I was uh, AVP of, of transportation, I think, during that period.
but it, he never, um, we had, we didn't have a whole lot of conversation. He was very interested in the, in the um, federal money that was starting to become available for upgrading of the infrastructure. And he worked a lot with the engineering guys on getting money for track improvements, which we badly needed. So I kind of ran the, the uh, operating side. And, uh, and you had counterparts in engineering and mechanical, I expect, at that time? Yeah. Right? You didn't have, they weren't reporting to you. No. Did no. you have good relationships with them? Yeah, I, I, I got along just fine with them. Even though the track was yeah. not what you wanted. We all knew what, what, the, what problems they had. I often was cooperating with them and trying to get some work done. But uh, so, uh, and, and Alsop was still a system general manager during this time. Was the locomotive fleet reliable? Uh, it wasn't bad. We did better on locomotives than we did on track. Maybe it's because uh, you could finance locomotives. You couldn't <laughs> finance track. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the uh, Wolf uh, was, was uh, very happy with, uh, <coughs> with uh, a gentleman named Jim Zito, who was uh, an operations guy that had been detailed to engineering. And Zito was a very good man. I, I had no, no problem with, with Zito what, what, at all. But, uh, but when, then when Provo died, Wolf becomes president. So the vice president of operations job was open. Everything else being equal, that should have been me. But it wasn't, it was Zito because he was more comfortable with Zito. He'd been working with Zito. I'm not knocking Jim Zito, who I think was outstanding, but he, he didn't have the background that I did. He was older, yeah. and that, that sometimes counts. You know, I never had a, anything you could call any kind of falling out with Zito. So I told, uh, uh, Wolf said, you're probably disappointed. And I said, I am. So I said, uh, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll work with it. And I said, I like Jim Zito. We're, we'll, we'll work fine. So we did. And, uh, and uh, but then they decide that um, I was a little bit too much horsepower for Zito to deal with. I was running the operation, and I told Zito, I said, you, you just leave me alone, it's going to be fine. Uh, so one day uh, I got called up to talk to Wolf, and he tells me they want me to be vice president of marketing, that we think we need to give Jim Zito some, some room. It's got to be his operation. So I said, well, I'm disappointed about this. I said, I never thought I'd wind up in marketing, but I said, <laughs> uh, and they offered me a nice in pay increase and all that. So I go and work in marketing for three years. Bud Braun was the, the senior vice president of sales and marketing, and uh, he and I always got along. So this was an interesting experience. And uh, they wanted somebody with an operating background sure. that could do uh, Work with, and I had the marketing managers for each of the, but they were in commodity groups: the grain guy, coal guy, the the automobile industry guy. You know, and I, they all reported to me. And did you have an intermodal guy at that point? We had an intermodal guy, and 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 he reported to me. And uh, and so, and I I kind of like this. This was interesting, and uh, so three years passed. One day I was up in, in uh, Wisconsin, but in the meantime, the operation was going downhill fast. And, and in marketing, of course, you, uh, you're dealing with customers, and I was hearing this from the customers. 
So <laughs> I was up in Wisconsin one day. It was the middle of the summer, I remember, and I was planning to go straight home. It was Friday afternoon. I'd been in Milwaukee. I got a call about 2 o'clock in the afternoon it was from, from Zito. Ed, you got to come, come to the office right away. I said, oh, Jim, can it wait until Monday? I, you know, it had been a long week. And No, you've got to come here right away, drop everything. And so I wind up, uh, instead, you know, drive through the evening, early evening rush hour. I got to his office about 5 o'clock. Okay, what? Bill Alsop is retiring. Or he's already retired. He's gone. And you're the, VP, you're the VP of transportation, and we're having the operating divisions report to you. And uh, we've got to fix this service problem. And he says, it just, it's nothing but come unglued since you left this department. And he said, uh, you probably know this. I said, yeah. I said, uh, I hear it from the customers, of course. So, so he said, well, will you take it? I said, well, I'm not sure. I said, I've gotten very comfortable with not getting these calls at 3 o'clock in the morning and things of that nature. And Damn it, you better take it. And, and I said, all right, I'll take it, Jim, but I'll take it for one reason, and that's that, uh, that uh, I've recognized as the head of marketing that my biggest problem is operations. So I'm going to go where I can fix that. All right, you're on. So I'm now I'm the... Vice President of Transportation, the 10 operating divisions are reporting to me. Uh, and we, we went and fixed it again. The, the second fixing of the service thing was nowhere near as hard as the first, first fixing. Sure. It was just a matter of implementing what we already knew.